And it's still the off season with Phoenix Hagen, and it's uh, hey, it's a sunny summer in Lorain, Ohio, uh, and we got the man of the hour uh, on sit, sitting across the ocean. Hey, last year when we uh, when we announced your your signing, uh, you transferring from Rastafesta to to Hagen, um, we, we put the headline. Nas is like so. So, uh, what should be the headline this summer, Nas Bohannon? <laughs> um. Oh, I got to I got to think on that. I, I love the creativity with with Nas is like in the rollout last year. The rendition of the Nas album, just the quote itself. Me and you talked. A couple other media outlets even took that from you, used it for podcast interview. Felix used it later on in the year for an interview in the, you know, uh, locker room before a game. So whatever we come up with has to be some somewhat still creative like that because I look I loved it and it stuck. Yeah. And it and it's dope. I mean I mean come on, he's a great artist, you're a great basketball player. So hey, that 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 alone that that's enough for me to put both words uh, together. Um, hey, we we got to discuss that right from the get-go. Um, everybody was like, damn, we added a huge and important piece in the summer of 23 with you coming over from Fechter. Um, and now having you back for the 24-25 season is even bigger. Uh, but take me through that process, uh, decision-making process when we when we talk about how it all came together, how the all the pieces came together for you this summer, ultimately leading to you signing back with Phoenix Hogan for the upcoming season. Um, just a multitude of things. Um, I'm big on quotes and mantras. And one thing I always talk about is going where we're celebrated, not tolerated, in this business for sure. You have to go to places where these people love you as much as you love them. And in the decision making process, you know, I talked to Chris a bunch of times. Me and Chris talked obviously before we left. And I made the comment to him before I left, like, it feels like I'm leaving home. Like, and I've been to a lot of places. I call myself a journeyman sometimes because I've done a bunch of things in a short amount of time. And I just I'm I'm big on, you know, seeing things for, for what they are and my thing. Like things have reasons. So I'm like, you just don't come across places. You don't come across environments. You don't come across, you know, family that you don't get to choose in situations like that very often. And that's near and dear to what it is. So I've made the comment to my family members and a couple of my friends, like, you know, when you think about the dream and being a professional basketball player, a lot of what's mustered up in that dream happens in a place like Hagen. You go somewhere and People know your name. People are wearing your jersey. Babies are screaming. The crowd is going crazy. You got tornadoes that drive hours away to come see you. And it's almost movie-like. And I've made those comments throughout the year. I was making them throughout the summer. And it's like, do things that align with you. I've been that type of guy my whole life. I've been a guy that's come in places and thrived. And, you know, let's build and get to the next step. And... We that we did that last year, and didn't get to get to the pinnacle. And it's like, nah, a place like this, which reminds me a lot like home as far as support system or just little community where everybody scratches each other back, deserves to get to the pinnacle. And that was pretty much, you know, my process making of like, nah, I can go to a couple other places where, hey, you still make an impact, you still do whatever, but. These people deserve what I feel like, you know, I deserve to, hey, to, to come back kids or to, you know, they look down on us a little bit and I wore that with probably like, no, we wear this jersey with probably this is high and we're here to stay. This is something real. And I'm eager to prove that again. Yeah. Was there any point over the course of last year's season where you would say, yeah, that's the moment or that's where I started to recognize all those things that you just mentioned? Because it always takes um, a little bit of time to, to really have everything 
sink in when you're in a new situation where you have to, it takes just some time to figure stuff out and how everybody functions and how the people are and, and so. Yeah. Um, so the first game, we go to Munster and there's a sea of yellow behind the bench, up and down. The game was like sloppy, ruggish, but it was the first game of the year. And pull into a game, we end up winning. And the Tornadoes chant for 25 minutes after the game. And we umba and we do everything else. And me and Sila look at each other like, hey, bro, like, nah, this is, this is more than what we thought it would be. So that was the first little glimpse of it. And then <laughs> we played Dusseldorf at home, which is, you know, probably kind of closer to the middle of the season. And it's a derby game, and emotions are high, and we do whatever else happens, and we get into a little push match. And then, you know, we have some chanting going on in the, in the stadium. And to see kids five years old and women – older just probably grandmas and just all ages and you know all come together and stand in unison and chant you know behind our behalf and i dance down the sideline and we do some other things you know but like that moment i'm like ah oh, nah i love this place like I, I love this place these people love us as much as we love them and like you know it's like as well yeah, it was it was awesome. I mean, the, there are certain occasions in life where you look around yourself and realize, like, how how on earth did this happen? How how did all those pieces fall together? You can't make stuff like this up. You can't make chemistry like this make up. And I think last year's squad was one of those. Yeah, or stood for one of those rare, really rare occasions where all the right pieces came together. Um, and this is not a trick question here, Nas, but and I and that's one of my most favorite questions that I that I throw at Chris from time to time, and he hates me for this. But uh, what did you learn about yourself last year that you did not know about yourself before? Um. I always would say that, like, I love to, I had a level of vulnerability that I didn't know that I always had, if that makes sense. Always was in leadership positions, like, my entire life, captain of this team. I was a captain at 18 in college. I was captain young or just leading in the classroom, leading in other ways of my life. Um, but the older I got, always been gritty, always been able to persevere and do certain things. Last year was like uh, one of the times I put myself to the side, like, and just wore my, like, emotions out or everything out, like, on the sleeve, like, hey, I'm rolling with it. I am, I've always been keen on I am who I am and it is what it is. But just, like, me and Chris had almost therapeutic sessions one-on-one -on -one multiple times throughout the year where I'm just like, hey, no, this is what's going on. No, I am in a dark place. Hey, I do miss my son. But hey, like, this has been the longest I've been without him or basketball is like this or I'm frustrated with this and it goes this way. And I didn't know, I, could, I knew I could do it because I, I encourage other people to do it. And people, most people usually put that on to me. And sometimes as a man, we, we don't never want to let people in on and there was times last year where I came to practice like, yeah, bro, I cried yesterday. It is what it is. I think my teammates are looking at me like, bro, like what? Nah, bro, I cried. I let it out. Don't worry. We can still play basketball. I'm still going to be the same dude. It's still going to be this. But yeah, I didn't know I had that level of vulnerability. And I think a team in a situation, like you said, bring some of those things out, especially when you have to be on the forefront. When you have to put yourself to the side some days and say, oh, okay. I'm having a bad day, but that guy needs me, so he has a good day. And this yeah. total situation needs me to continue to be better, so I cannot be self-centered. And in wearing that, it weighs on you, and you got to let it out. And what better time to let it out than leaning on somebody else? 
absolutely. Especially uh, when you can let it out in front of people that you're going through thick and thin over the course of those nine, ten months, whatever. Um, and I truly believe this is a beautiful thing to, to recognize for oneself. And I, I do believe I texted you this at some point last season. I can't recall what exact moment it was, but I feel like it was one of those. I think it was more or less like, hey, we can be humble fathers, you know, and, and show those emotions and be beasts inside the arena as well. And and you can have both sides and it's totally fine. As you so rightfully stated, hey, to show that vulnerability uh, and still go out to work. You know, that and, and I believe at the end of the day, this shows um, how, how it, it shows your personal growth to really accept, hey, I can be this and this, and I have so many sides to my persona, and it's okay. I yep. can have, I can show all these sides, and that's all within me because all these different angles complete me as a as a person. Is is this something um, where you say? A lot of this comes from the the environment that that coach creates around the team. Yes, I'll say like, and we had team meetings last year where I would tell guys I played a lot of ball for a lot of different coaches <laughs> at a lot of different times, and I was telling guys like, hey, appreciate the situation that coach puts us in. Like the fact that you can come in and you can speak your mind or that he's open to letting you learn or develop and do some things like a lot of times, especially at the level we're at now, this becomes real business like, like, hey, you deliver or you don't deliver and somebody comes and gets your job and it's a dog eat dog world and we don't have patience for guys who, you know, don't want to speak up or don't have charisma and character. And Chris is the opposite of that. Chris is a guy where, you know, he's like. I'm calling him Chris instead of coach <laughs> as we're talking now, you know, and he creates that type of aura where he's like guys, friends, and he's encouraging me, he lets you come in and he, he lets you be yourself and he wants you to, it's okay to make mistakes or we'll talk you through this and, you know, and sometimes because he's that way, a lot of patience from his side, but guys have to, you know, I say embrace that and then appreciate it. And then understand like, hey, this is this is unique and it helps you grow as a person. That guy whose job really determines is based off of wins and losses, cares more about developing you as a person and us getting to the next level than him taking the next step as a coach. And that is beautiful. Absolutely. And I think it can totally coexist with one another. At least from my point of view, I mean, mm -hmm. when when I say hey, I'm working with the group over here, and uh, giving everybody the, the room and the freedom to to evolve and develop into a better, stronger, more outspoken person, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, hey, if if you're doing a good job in in that regard, hey, the wins will follow. Come on, I mean, it's it's just a a different approach. How you how you attack that that basketball business, uh, sure. if you will. Uh, what was over the course of last year? Was there somebody or or some scenario uh, where you would say, "Damn, I did not know it was inside of him." Regardless, it's I don't know. Maybe some some teammates speaking up or some actions that somebody took on the floor or whatever. Um. First two people off the top of my head is Brock and Lenny. Um, you know, going in to the year, like knew Brock can play, knew, you know, he was from the West Coast, knew, you know, skilled, do some things. At home, West Coast guys get a knock for being skilled, but not being, you know, as rugged, as as tough, like having some things to him. <laughs> like guys, that's a that's a cliche. Come on. Yeah. Or is it uh it's I mean there's Basketball at home, you know, hey, East Coast guys can dribble. They can, like, they're going to have some swag to their game. They're going to be hard nosed. They're going to go. You play a Midwest team, it's going to be grimy. It's going to be gritty. They're going to junk it up. That's Chicago. That's Cleveland. That's, you know, Indiana. Those type of dudes. 
you, if you think about guys who you might have covered or been around the team, you might start to put some of these cliches together, you know, down tough athletes. But when I think of Brock, you know, going into the year, I was like, hey, like he's a shooter. Like, he does this, whatever. But we get into the game, and, like, excuse my friends, I'm like, oh, Mike has some shit to him. Like, he's feisty. Like, the Deuce of Dwarf situation. The guy steps over Chrissy. Brock's the first one to push him. Like, no, nah, oh, yeah, he's protected. Like, okay, he's that guy. Like, I didn't know he had that. Like, having that in being as cute as he is, I'm like, hey, that guy can play ball, like, for four minutes. Lenny. Um, Lenny's another guy that when you talk to Lenny off the court, <laughs> he's like a gentle giant, you know? Like, well-spoken but soft-mannered, does things, you know, where it's like, okay, cool. And I'm looking at a guy like, hey, you're still – got touch, can shoot a three ball, need a dog. Like, does he have a dog? And there was moments last year where he's blocked this off glass, catch it, dunk, beat his chest, pump his fist to the crowd. And I'm like, I'll tell him, and I've told him that. Like, that guy right there, like, we wouldn't even be on the same team together right now. You're that guy all the time. And just – be that guy. It's okay to be that guy. And you're showing that it's in you. Keep living on that guy and watch where you go with this game. Yeah. It, it, it came to some surprise when you showed the, those kind of emotions. That's that's for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think, again, it speaks volumes about the culture that we have over here because if you would not, I mean, we got to ask him about it, but I feel like if he would not feel whatever welcomed, secure, um, he would not be able to outlive all those emotions, on whether regardless of whether it's on the floor or off the floor. You know, if you always feel like, ooh, how my 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 environment react to the way I express myself, yep. you might tone down a little, but the way that he's even able and, and willing and yeah, that he's going over the over the top, if you will. I mean, it speaks volumes. Speaks volumes to to the culture that that we live out here, and and, and that's cool. Um, but but speaking of speaking of Brock, um, so it was just like you, if you would not have known that he's from the the West Coast, where would you say, hey, he's located from? I don't know. The Middle East, or even East Side of the of the states, or um, Brock, Brock could fit in in the Midwest. Okay, he could, he, he could fit in in the Midwest. Low maintenance dudes who you know, like just grind grit, like on that little rust belt of things, play hard, have some grit to him, but skill you know he'd probably be a better shooter than a lot of us in the middle was so we don't want to get that many you know shooters some of us because it's windy in the midwest and in, yeah. and in, in the in the middle east as well you know when it comes to, to playing around basketball that's why at least that's what all the guys from the chicago area always tell me it's so damn windy outside over here we gotta attack the basket we can't let it fly from the outside because if you let it fly from the outside the ball is gonna gonna land half a mile over there yeah I got a court outside that has a rim that thick or double rim True. in between. So, yeah, a lot of park ball, a lot of outside. You know, not too much. It's not a lot of good weather. <laughs> you got winter till you got summer, and you just survive mode. So, yeah, Brock, Brock could fit in. I would take Brock to some hoop sessions, you know, about anywhere, but I can, I can bring him home, and I know he'll survive. And there's not a lot of guys that I say that about. Yeah, absolutely. And he had and he had those strong legs. I think that's that's a secret f for him. He could he could man up when, yeah. with, regardless whether it's on the perimeter or when he's been posted up whatsoever. He, he's he's got strong legs. And the thing with Brock is um, the moment I realized or that it really sank in for me personally, uh, where I knew he's, he's not the the common rookie was uh, Thanksgiving uh, when the whole team came together and it was it was Brock speaking up and, and giving thanks and, and saying prayers. 
uh, in front of, I don't know how many people we had over there at the event, but it was a ton of people and it was a beautiful event. But with him speaking up and then standing up and, you know, bringing the, the entire group together with him saying praise, um, that right there told me that, yeah, he's he's a special he's a special rookie, absolutely. Um, but but speaking of coming back to to playground basketball, I saw a couple of clips from this summer. I believe you've you've been playing some hoops overseas. Was that right? Some summer league or, or yeah. pro am league or whatever it may be. Yep, I definitely playing the pro am. So the pro am is uh, it's ran by I call him OG, but uh, Vance Marbury and uh, Steve Newton, the third coach, the guy with the camera, have been a duo for a while. This is maybe, I think it's summer 16, like the 16th year that the Pro-Am has been running. So I've seen it, I've grown up on it, I've been playing in it since I was a high schooler. And now I'm kind of like, the baton has been passed to me, sometimes earlier than what it should have been. But like, I appreciate the Pro-Am because it's put me in a network of pros for my entire life so I can learn things and do, you know, hey, here's how this is going on. There's some basketball knowledge I've learned in that pro end. So every time I come home, I'm I'm playing in the weekends that I'm around. I'm getting on the team and I'm going to play. So, yeah, I've been playing. That's how I go sharpen. I always say, like, you know, you got to sharpen your knife, but you got to make sure you can use it at war too. So throughout the week, I'm going to work out Monday to Friday. And this weekend, I got to go see if, if the work works. Yeah. So, so uh, when you're coming back in August over here to to Hagen, so what's going to be uh, a new tool in your in your box? Did have you been able to to add something over the summer? Listen, JB, I'm so like, you know, we talked about being like like humble beast, and I've I've seen this video and I've let it replay in my head time and time again, like. Don't be too humble that you disappear in a room. And this summer I've been like, not agitated, but like, just like, you know, chomping at the bit, like as far as like the basketball world and how some things maneuver in that space, like making sense of basketball world doesn't make sense to do sometimes. I'm in a space where it's like, all right, I'll, I'm going to continue to be myself, but I'll, I'm going to back to the guy that that you don't that a lot of people haven't seen you see it you know, you bark the emotions to all of that but okay now now let's take it like i'm not asking for anything i'm not the tip we're here we're here to stay and i'll show it with my play like lock us in a room and i'll come out with somebody's skin in my teeth and that that's my mentality so as far as the toolbox goes like i'm i'm feeling more comfortable than i felt before you know, we talked last summer, and I was like, "Hey, I finally got you know some football weight off, and now I'm I'm starting to move again, and you know I I can jump a little more. And I got now I'm like, oh, I'm like two eighteen, two twenty now, and all right, shoot the ball. You want me to shoot the ball? I'll show you I can shoot the ball. Shot forty from three in the in the playoffs, and it's like, okay, well let's build on it. Not about proof, let the game come to us. And I'm I'm ready to prove that I am who I believe that I am and that my team is who I believe that we are. And we have all the opportunity to do it. Like, I can't wait for the preseason and the Poco Cup and everything else. So, yeah. That, that's going to be so much fun. The Cup game. Ooh. I think for, for us, it's a a great chance to really see how huge the gap is mm -hmm. from where we are right now to whatever BBL team we might face up there. Yep. Um, you you played, did you play the cup game during your time with Fester? I don't think so. Was it? Did you? No, I don't think you played, right? Now, because you were a late addition, and I think that was before the, um, the format was uh, re yep. reinstated. Right, true. Um, but but nonetheless, um, from what you've seen so far, and you know so many guys, and I do believe you're still super close with most most of the guys from from Fechter, um, Can you somehow describe or, or give me a sense of how far you feel we're we're away 
just playing wise from from a BBL level team? Um, <laughs> it's funny you ask that. And when you talk to BK, ask him about how during March Madness, I was I was arguing against the whole house about the fact that we would we we, we might have beat a BBL team last year, right? And at Vecta, we had that same like belief system, the team that I was on there, like line them up, you know, that's half the battle. So if you ask me the question about can we be the BBO team, half the battle is going to be belief. Okay. True. We come in here as four lines, as two goals, it's basketball. So if you get guys to lose the sense of like, oh, uh, we're facing Goliath. No, nah. and you know, these guys put on their shoes like we put on our shoes. Um. From a plan standpoint, and if, if we build on what we built on last year, especially now being a team with majority of guys back and we know the system and we know, you know, game flow, we have better IQ, there's there's no substitute for experience, the gap is, is not that big. Like, I've played with a multitude of guys at every level, at the highest level of college basketball, mid-level college basketball, but the highest level AAU, low level AAU, I know majority of guys that are on that level. And the difference between these levels, honestly, be sometimes that guy's a step quicker, that guy's a little more athletic, that guy's a different. Some of these guys don't have the grit, they don't have the chemistry, they don't have the things that we have. And the more up you go, the more seasoned and smart basketball player you have to be. You make mistakes versus a BBL team, they're going to make you fail. You can't make the same mistake twice. You have to understand when is this a good shot versus a bad shot, the value of every possession, you know, building on things like that. You're not that far off. We're not that far off. And then, of course, like, you run into a situation where if you're asking if it's us versus Munich, like, shit, I still think we go in and go, you go fight, and that's going to be, you know, half the battle. And, you know, you never know what happens. You lock us in the room. You make that. That's me. I, underdog mentality. Do that. But, of course, when they got millions of dollars to go from play and pay NBA players, <laughs> then, all right, you, you might run into something. But, JB, it's not, it's not as far as, like, everybody thinks it is. And that's what I came in with that mentality last year. Like, hey, no, nah, not let's make playoffs. We can win this. It's not as hard as you think that we, that we can win this. It's very tangible. And watch guys turn their gears. And the more it started happening, we start off 7-1. and one. And then you keep winning games. You come out of break, you go through a law, you pick it up again. It started to be like, oh, we, we play at the issue today? We're not losing. Like, we're winning. And now we're doing this. That piece, you if you have that piece, like, the gap is never that. We all been playing ball since seven, eight years old. So how much better is a guy? It, it's it's here, here instead of here, here. You a pro, you get paid to play basketball. Like LeBron gets paid to play basketball. Now that might be the greatest basketball player ever, but in its essence, you're just saying this because you're from Ohio. Come on, <laughs> you seen it? You seen it? <laughs> True. Hey, I'm almost twice your age, so hey, I'm a I'm an MJ guy, but I can go with LeBron. I mean, it's two different eras, but we're not gonna touch this subject now because that's a that's a never-ending discussion. Um, but I totally feel what what you're saying. Um, and the thing is, so many guys over the course of last season reached out to me regardless of whether it's opposing teams, coaches or players or media people. And everybody was asking me the same question was like, what's making this team so damn good? Um, and I'm saying it's, it's not the X's and O's. It's not, it's not a cent, not exclusively our basketball smarts. It's, it's not our physic. It's not the athletic, uh, athleticism that we have on the roster. It's this bond, it's this dog mentality that, that you so rightfully described. Um, and it's this, you can't break this team mentally. There's no way on earth that this team is going to fall apart. I mean, you, if you want to come in here and, and beat us, you've got to work for it. 
because yeah. hey, regardless of whether we have a 12 man uh, rotation or a 10 man or if we're down to seven whatever a hey, whoever you're facing who's wearing a phoenix Hagen uniform they're gonna give it your all and they're gonna you, you gotta work your way uh to victory um and and that's i think was one of the unique qualities that last year's team had and and was the uh the tiebreaker versus so many other teams that at some point they broke apart you know regardless yeah. sometimes it's shots not falling your way and they break apart sometimes they the opposing team has a 10 or run hey they break apart but that's not been us uh and i think that's and I do believe um, that had a lot to do with the way you led the team, uh, regardless whether it's whether it was on the floor or within the locker room. Um, where, where, and I think we never discussed this last summer, but where does that leadership quality come from on, on your end? Is this something that you learned over the years or is this something where you say, hey, it always was within me, but I have maybe not not been in a situation where I could live it the way I did it last year? A little of both, a little of both. There's some times where like I go back and I just think like, you know, that didn't come from anywhere. Like I've kind of always thought that way. Um, But a lot of it, I say, and I said that earlier, is like there's no substitute for experience. So I understood young that I had influence on people. Whether it could be good or bad, it was up to me on, you know, how I used it. Like I was the biggest kid in class. So if I wanted to be a bully, I could have been a bully. But like I used my voice, I spoke up. I had the ability to bring people together. You know, I always say, like people ask me my why, my purpose, and I've always talked about, you know to serve and to help others. And leadership quality, like the things I learned, I learned by by doing. There's times where like, I say now, and there's times in high school where I'm like, oh, I did that bad. I led in the wrong way. I had my influence and like, I knew I can get coach out of his hookup. I can get us kicked out of practice. But what did that do for the guy? Like, I would have been fine. Yeah, of course, I'm excelling athletically and academically, but for the guy that, is rough around the edges. He needed to be at practice that day to continue to save his life. So a lot of it just, you know, learn and learn and learn. As a young kid, you know, you into yourself and you like, how do I be outside of myself? Okay, yeah, we lost and I'm just as mad as he is, but I have to have the energy to go say, hey, it was my fault. Even if I know that this guy, you know, didn't perform and do some things, I didn't always have that. So just being forced because of what my personality has always been, big personality, love to talk, love to bring energy, love to bring light, always being pushed into the position and then just start wearing it. Like, you know, I've wore it every time and never ran away from it. I said to you before, like I was a captain at 18 at my college. So I tell guys all the time, imagine being 18 and trying to get 23 and 24 year olds to listen to what you have to say but you stand on what you do in the room and you know people gravitate towards it when it's real it takes uncomfortable conversations it takes you know standing in the fire and willing to learn so all of those years of willing to learn how to lead and not just leading people blindly set me up for moments like last year where there's times where (laughs) Lenny and and um, Dennis are the oldest guys in the room. But I say some things and they're like, bro, you're not 25, bro. Like, like where did that come from? Bro? Like, where, like, where did you get this quote? Where did you do? And I'm just like, I've, I've been experienced. I've been around the block. I, I know some things, so I know how to get to guys. I went to a leadership camp before and that played a big role. And, you know, knowing that every guy doesn't learn the same or isn't to be led the same. In high school, you with a bunch of guys you grew up with. So we all kind of been through those same shared experiences, the same kind of lifestyle, the same whatever. So we can respond to the same type of thing. Up until that camp, you know, I'm leading from that standpoint. Hey, bro, I can 
I need to pull his jersey, bro. Get your shit together. You No, this guy doesn't respond to that. That guy needs a pat on the back. That guy may need his jersey pulled. This guy may need to be told, hey, bro, you do know, like, like you're the best wing in, in, in the world. You're the best wing in this league. And sometimes it may be a little delusion, but it'll get him to be the best version of himself. And, you know, so I, I do it so much in my life, not just even in basketball, that it becomes natural. And times like last year, it was, it was good because I could, I had to be my full self, even when I didn't want to be. Yeah. And one thing is, you have all, you have so many different personalities on a on a team um and i think that that's a a great book that i once uh read and i gotta give it to you over the course of of next season is um surrounded by idiots that's that's the title um and it deals with all different kinds of personas so so the the basic idea of the book is um mankind is divided or is categorized in, in four different groups uh, and they're labeled green red yellow and um red i think so so it's four colors by the way and, and each category works differently so when i would talk to to you and bring want to bring my message uh, across i gotta phrase it in your direction somewhat differently than i have to address the same thing to to coach or to Dennis or to Lenny because they have a different persona. So basically, it helps you to are uh, maybe not yeah realize who you are as a person, how you function, and how people around you function, and that they function in different ways, and that help so helps so much uh, just yeah communicating with with people and bringing messages across and and reading what they are really saying because um hey they they might function differently from how you function so when they say something you don't always have to take it the way it it hits your ear but you gotta you don't have to uh take it the way you hear it but what are they trying to say so you have to always interpret it uh, interpret what they what they're trying to say um and and you could transfer this to 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 a locker room where you have all those different kinds of kinds of people and and people from all those from those four categories um but what really caught my attention with you was um is when you say you talk a lot i would say to some degree, yes, but one, you are one of those guys who, um, who's it super easy to talk to because you're making it easy to have a conversation. And on the other hand, when you are raising your voice, when you are saying something, you're not just saying something to just talk, you're actually saying something. And that's a, a huge difference. This always in the locker room, this, you're not just saying something just to say something, just saying something to bring a message across. And that's, uh, I think that's huge for, for any team. Um, but the point I'm trying to make or, or come to, to a conclusion over here uh, for, for, this, for this conversation is a good friend of ours, uh, let's say, or let's put him by the name of Silas Schneider, once told me and that quote stuck with me and it's going to stick with me for the rest of my life is comparison is a thief of joy that's what he told me last summer and it so stuck with me and it has been resonating with me ever since he he gave me that quote um how much or oh, is there any way you have to prevent yourself from taking any shortcuts when we talk about a uh, working with the team for the 24-25 season uh and not always say or not draw that comparison to the 23-24 squad and say hey let's take what we have over there for granted and go from there what are the maybe little tiny pieces where you say hey that's one thing where we can't take a shortcut um the culture the culture Wins and losses, like the nucleus of a team is, is going to be, you know, 10 months. 
We talk about it. As much as we love guys, it's our lifespan for that team is 10 months. It won't be if you rarely at this level get back the same exact team. So I agree with the quote that comparison is deep with joy. You have to have tunnel vision and you have to be where your feet are. We can't relish in the past, but you can appreciate it and you have to appreciate what the guys before you did to help you get to the next step. So in that, the biggest thing that when I come down, even to the guys who were there last year is, yeah, wins and losses, whatever happens, we went to the playoffs, we, you know, go to the semis, we do whatever. The culture has to stay intact. You don't take shortcuts around culture, whether it's hard lessons and, you know, things that have to be called out in the moment. But like last year was the dip your toe in the water of, hey, this is who we are. This year is like, no, you're expected to play hard. You're expected to be a dog. You're expected to, like, those are non-negotiables. We're expected to be family. We're expected. Those have, you, you don't take shortcuts around culture. And like you said earlier with, you know, coaches approach with letting guys become better men that wins will follow. Six or seven wins throughout the year are based strictly off culture. Off, they're not going to break our bond. We're going to, we've been through hard things together. Like this fourth quarter, we're going to go on a 10, 12 point run. It's going to break it apart because that's just who we are. We never stop the fight. We do something. And that's what you have to implement to the new guys to let them know like, hey, what happened the years before you was earned. It wasn't given like in what they built. And last year we talked about trying to get to the penthouse or the top of the mountain and like, you know, the pinnacle, whichever everybody, you know, anywhere any guys want to use, you have to have stepping stones. Last year was a big stepping stone. So what better way to show the guys before you that Thank you for giving me the baton to go maybe finish the race, which is our goal. You have to you have to show them that you appreciate the culture that they built. And that's the biggest part that I say with, with no shortcut. And yeah, don't compare. Because I've been here before too. Like I was on a team in high school that I said it to Chris during the year, like, have you ever lived in a movie before? He's like what you mean? I'm like, I lived in the movie before. It felt a lot like this. Like, we were undefeated. Like, sold out crowds. Like, we sold out Akron for the first time since LeBron in high school. Like, people, fans going crazy. They were buying tickets from our high school games for $70. And we were undefeated until we lost in the regional final. And then the next year, it was like, okay, that was then. What do we do now? How do we, how do we rally against each other? You're going to have naysayers. Oh, they can't do it twice. All oh, that was fluke. All oh, that was this. And we got to the same exact point that we got to the year before with what they thought was a less roster or whatever else, strictly based because of culture. And then two years later, guys go to the state final four and they went based off of we've seen when and we know how to win. We know this is what we do. We know this is who we are. And this is what it means to put on, you know, that jersey. That's what we have to implement. I- this Hoggins jersey. I came with an idea of let's push it forward from what JJ and Kesson and you know Kyle and them guys did the year before and you know they ran into us at that point. Okay, well now let's go the next step. They don't they sometimes when you lay in the first bricks you don't get to see <laughs> the finished building. You know, let's think about the cathedral in Cologne. And how long it took to build that, and how many? I know how long it took them to build that. <laughs> like to that cathedral. Do you know how long it took them? I've been three, four times, and I have this pamphlet. Um, Almost seven hundred years. Right. So when we think about that, and you think about the jersey was amazing last year with twenty years of Phoenix and all the guys' names on. Everybody who came before you to get you to that moment, having Pete and his guys from 50 years ago come in and, you know, they celebrate their championship and we have that type of year. Next year, guys have to appreciate everything that comes with what's before them and what our culture is. And no, hey, 
that was then, this is now. And how do we be, not to say better, but how do we be the best version of 24-25 while keeping that culture intact of what Hagen and that basketball brand is? When you say Hagen to anybody in Germany or anybody who knows that basketball world, you know you're going to a basketball-loving place. You know you're going to a place where the fans are going to be crazy, where people are going to appreciate one another. And, hey, it might not be the prettiest on the outside, but you're, you're going to feel like home, and you have to embrace it because it'll embrace you. Absolutely. And I think, um, hey, those those are great closing remarks, Nas. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's – we don't know uh, to come back to – to the artist Nas, uh, it was written, that, but that's for the future. But uh, we got to write our our own story going forward. And uh, the the best thing to look at it is truly to hey, you don't want to be part of the journey. Hey, you got to create the the journey, or you know help you know lay those bricks down the road that that you're able to walk on, and and every everybody was was coming behind you. A uh, hey, what a beautiful closing remark. Uh, thanks for for those for those words. Thanks for the conversation. And, uh, oh man, can't wait to, to see you in August. All right, thank you. Can't wait to get there. <laughs>